Well, good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning for the Digital Academy's Virtual Launch Symposium and Learning Festival. I'm told that in our midst, we have distinguished guests and public officers from the whole of government. Now, we're honored to have you here with us, and the invitation this morning is to sit back, relax, grab a beverage of choice, and to participate. My name is Joe Augustin, Singapore's first forcibly retired TikTok user. And I will be your MC this morning. Now, do note that our entire event will be recorded. And for the best experience, we'll recommend that you join us on a laptop or desktop. Although I know some of you are going to be on your mobiles anyway. Uh, we're truly excited for what's to come. And I know the team has been working hard for several months now to bring you this event. The Digital Academy by GovTech is a practitioner for practitioner academy that operates at the unique intersection of technology and public service and will groom future-ready digital leaders to be well-versed in the technology ecosystem to accelerate the public sector's digital transformation. This morning, we thank you for being part of the official launch and we look forward to our journey together to upskill our public sector, you. We will commence the launch ceremony with a welcome address by Ms. Janet Ang. Now, Janet is the chairman of the Institute of System Science at National University of Singapore, Singapore Polytechnic, Cystic.com, and deputy chairman of Singapore Business Federation Foundation. She's also a nominated member of parliament and is Singapore's non-resident ambassador to the Holy See. Ms. Janet Ang, please. introduction. Dr. Janil Puducherry, Senior Minister of State in the Ministry of Communications and Information and the Ministry of Health. Mr. Ng Chi Ken, Permanent Secretary for the Smart Nation and Digital Government in the Prime Minister's Office and Chairman of the Gov Government Technology Agency, GovTech. Mr. Kok Ping Soon, Chief Executive of GovTech Professor Tan Eng Chai, President of the National University of Singapore, NUS. Professor Ho Teck Hua, Senior Deputy President and Provost of NUS. Mr. Kung Chan Meng, CEO of NUS Institute of System Science, ISS. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning to all of you. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the launch symposium of the Digital Academy. This launch is truly a momentous occasion as we witness yet another innovative and forward-thinking initiative in support of Singapore's smart nation visionary leadership. ISS is honored to be the operations partner of the Digital Academy, contributing our expertise and experience to play our part in the whole of government's digital transformation. Back in 1981, when the Singapore government forged ahead with our transformation into a knowledge-based economy, ISS was established through a partnership amongst the then National Computer Board, NCB, the National University of Singapore, NUS, and IBM to develop and train IT skills to meet the needs of Singapore's knowledge-based economy. Apparently, there were only 700 data processing professionals in Singapore at that time. Well, like they say, the rest is history. Since then, more than 150,000 IT professionals have passed through the doors of NUS ISS, contributing to the growth and development of Singapore's ICT industry and tech enabling all other industries and the public service. From the civil service computerization program in the 80s to the smart nation movement today, and from the evolution of NCB to today's GovTech, ISS has continued to align its programs with national plans and priorities for digital capability building. Each year, more than 10,000 PMETs from more than 900 companies come to ISS to reskill themselves for the digital economy. And amongst them, some 2,000 professionals from our public service graduate from ISS programs 
with hot and emerging skills such as artificial intelligence, data science, software development, design thinking, agility, and product management. COVID-19 has become the key driver that accelerated digitalization across the board, whether to facilitate HBL or WHF, or pay now or trace together, online GSS or JJ Lin's virtual concert. As industries and the economy prepare for the new normal, there are tremendous opportunities to leverage di digital to emerge stronger. The Digital Academy could not have been launched at a more opportune time. It will forge a strong and sustained operating model facilitated by GovTech and ISS for the public service, content partners, and training partners to collaborate and enhance our public service digital capabilities. I am confident that the Academy will grow from strength to strength. Over the past six months, the GovTech and ISS colleagues have worked extremely hard as one TDA team to set up the operations, systems, and learning programs and be ready for today's launch. You will get to experience some of the innovative learning journeys they have put together including tournaments, workshops, and case studies during the week-long learning festival that starts later this afternoon. A big shout out to Ping Soon and Chan Meng's teams and our partners for their passion and hard work. Kudos also to the work wonderful crew working around the clock behind the scenes to produce this event. To conclude, I would like to thank GovTech for entrusting NUSISS with this mission in partnership. I thank Minister Janil for being our guest of honor. And I thank all of you for joining us this morning. And I wish you an enjoyable and productive symposium. Thank you, Janet, for that warm opening address. Next, it's our honor to invite Dr. Janil Puticherry to officially open the event with a speech. Dr. Puticherry is Senior Minister of State, Ministry of Communications and Information, and Ministry of Health. He is concurrently Minister in Charge of GovTech and a member of the Ministerial Committee overseeing the Smart Nation and Digital Government Group. Senior Minister of State, please. Thank you very much, Joe, and thank you to Janet for that uh, warm welcome speech as well. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today for the official launch of the Digital Academy. It's uh, an, an important milestone that will help us to accelerate public sector digitalization as part of the Smart Nation agenda. In setting up the Digital Academy, we hope to offer something for all of you, whether you are uh, in a tech role or not. A capable and innovative digital government is an important pillar for our Smart Nation vision. And it's more important than, what is more important than any hardware, software, or cloud system that the government uses are our ability to continually learn about digital technologies and our commitment to apply this knowledge to solve problems for our citizens, for businesses, and our nation. As we can see from our COVID-19 responses, building the public sector's strength in digital capabilities and developing our infrastructure and fostering an agility in adapting digital tools to meet the needs has paid off. From digital contact tracing to home-based learning, there are many, many examples which we are living every day. And even as we continue to grapple with COVID-19, we're embarking on new ways of working and serving the public good. We can't slow down building a digital government. All our roles in public service require us to achieve at least a foundational level of digital literacy. For public service leaders, myself included, we have to be familiar enough with the issues so that we can identify priorities and standards in the public sector's digital transformation. For the ICT professionals that work amongst us, it's, it's much more than that. It means deepening your expertise while expanding and updating the skills and tools that you're familiar with. 
the half-life of skills is about five years in general. And for tech skills, they need to be refreshed about eight, every 18 months. We have to keep learning to stay relevant. And while we do have access to a wide range of resources available within our agencies and our public service, there's even more on external learning platforms. This digital academy that we launched today has a unique value proposition. It's practitioner for practitioner. It's a practitioner for practitioner academy. Its curriculum is curated and contextualized for the public sector, combining expert knowledge from tech practice leads in GovTech and industry partners that bring with them their expertise and reputation. Programs are designed and delivered in an agile way to address the fast changing tech landscape for the direct application in the business of government. The Digital Academy offers blended learning and also emphasizes applied learning. There are three outcomes uh, in the Digital Academy we seek to achieve. First, deepening capabilities amongst ICT professionals in the public service. Second, ensuring a foundational level of digital knowledge and appreciation amongst all public officers. And finally, increasing confidence amongst our public sector leaders so that we can lead the necessary digital transformation in our agencies. For public sector ICT officers, the Digital Academy will become their primary platform for deepening their technical knowledge and their capabilities. Since the launch of the Digital Government Blueprint in 2018, we've taken concrete steps towards improving the ability of the public sector to attract, develop, and retain officers with digital skills. We've implemented the ICT competency framework for public officers in technical roles to identify development opportunities, to help them gain new skills, and to take on different roles. More importantly also is to share and learn with peers within the same functional cluster. We've also used and developed assessment tools to help us along our digitalization journey. Examples include the Digital Maturity Index and the Ministry Family Digitalization Plans. The success of this digital academy will rest on partnerships with leaders in industry, academia, and government. Our ICT professionals will enhance their learning through an open platform that combines the latest knowledge with practical insights into public sector applications. To date, the Academy has signed memorandums of understanding with nine industry thought leaders as content partners, namely Amazon Web Services, Coursera, Google, Microsoft, ClickTech, Secure Code Warrior, Singtel Trustwave, Tableau, and ThoughtWorks. By working with the capability centers within GovTech in areas such as digital infrastructure, data science and AI, and cybersecurity, the Digital Academy will become a community for practitioners by practitioners to share experiences and expertise, lessons and insights across all our ICT offices. Our estimate is that over 6,600 ICT offices can benefit from advanced Digital Academy courses that are already available, ranging from building large scale cloud systems to data visualization and secure coding practices. Building a digitally capable public service can be traced back 40 years ago to the establishment of the National Computer Board in 1981. One of the goals at that time was to implement the computerization of the civil service by teaching public officers basic computer literacy and automating government services. In shifting our reliance from paper documents and fax machines towards email and the internet, the public service not only became more efficient, but was also better equipped to evaluate, lead, and implement subsequent digitalization efforts. The context of today is different from 1981, but the challenge to understand digital technologies and apply them in the public sector remains similar. The Digital Academy, in collaboration with the Public Service Division and the Civil Service College, will help equip you with a foundational set of digital skills that are increasingly indispensable such as data analytics and cybersecurity. The skill sets and mindsets developed through these courses will contribute towards the larger goal of public sector transformation in order to keep the public service relevant and agile in an increasingly digital first environment. The Digital Academy will also support learning for our public sector leaders, providing them with technology, skills to lead digital transformation in government. 
data security, agile development, and machine learning are increasingly part of the language used in the public service. And the leadership needs to be familiar with these issues. We hope that public officers from all backgrounds and positions will be able to benefit from the Digital Academy. Please sign up for one of the more than 95 programs available by the end of March, 2022. And then actively apply that knowledge or the skills that you have gained in your daily work and better still, teach and transfer what you've learned to others in your team. Finally, congratulations to GovTech and the Digital Academy team and the, Gov and the Academy's operations partner, the Institute of System Science at the National University of Singapore. And we are very grateful for their enthusiastic partnership and involvement in developing this academy and our offering to all the participants in the future, as well as all our nine content partners on board for today's official launch. To everyone, I hope that you will participate actively in the Learning Festival taking place from this afternoon until the end of this week. Have a great week and please take care. Thank you, Minister, for your insightful and inspiring words. In our next segment, we would like to take some time to recognize key partners, starting with the operations partner of the Digital Academy, NUSISS. The Institute of System Science at National University of Singapore develops digital talent for the industry through graduate education, executive education programs, consultancy, and research services. NUSISS is a widely recognized champion of industry transformation, future jobs, and future skills, enabling a digital economy that is always learning and always leading. NUSISS was established in 1981 as part of the national strategy to transform Singapore into a knowledge-based economy. Beginning with a training cohort of public service leaders, we went on to partner the National Computer Board, Infocom Development Authority, and now GovTech. Over the past four decades, we supported the Civil Service Computerization Program, e-government action plans, as well as the current Digital Government Reprint. The NUSISS operating model is an open and collaborative platform for industry practitioners to learn as well as teach, to share experience as well as be mentored. Programs are continuously refreshed to ensure that learning outcomes are always impactful. By providing multiple learning pathways and modalities, we guide learners to cross each bridge of challenges towards new heights of digital excellence. We will leave no talent behind. We are deeply honoured to be appointed the operations partner for the Digital Academy. We are committed to work very closely with GovTech, with all other content partners and the training partners, as well as the whole of government to make the Digital Academy an amazing success. Ladies and gentlemen, CEO of NUSISS, Mr. Kung Chan Meng. Very good morning to our public service leaders, our distinguished guests, our partners and colleagues. On behalf of NUSISS, we wish to express our sincere gratitude to GovTech for this great partnership on the Digital Academy. The Digital Academy team brings to you a wide range of learning programs and as Minister said, many, many more exciting programs are coming your way. So we would like to encourage everyone to please sign up, encourage your colleagues to enroll in the learning programs and also share with the Digital Academy team what are the ways in which we can help you and your respective agencies to pursue your goals in digital transformation. So we are really looking forward to working with everyone and thank you very much. 
Thank you, Mr. Kung, for your sharing. And also, we look forward to that uh, new NUS ISS campus where future Digital Academy classes will be conducted. Next up, we're thrilled to showcase our content partners with whom the Digital Academy will be working to curate contextualized and rigorous programs to train you, our public officers. These are the best-in-class industry partners and also leading academic institutions. Amazon Web Services, the world's most comprehensive and broadly adopted cloud platform. Coursera, providing world-class training to upskill at scale. Google Cloud, helping organizations solve their most critical business problems. Microsoft, empowering every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Click, lead with data. Secure Code Warrior, creating positive skills-based pathways for developers to write secure code at speed. Tableau, Tableau helps people see and understand data. ThoughtWorks, creating extraordinary impact through our technology excellence. Singtel TrustWave, leading cybersecurity and managed security services provider that's focused on threat detection and response. Thank you to all our content partners for committing to train our future ready leaders of tomorrow. We will now officially launch the Digital Academy. And for that, I'd like to invite all our VIPs to please turn on the cameras. From uh, left to right. Mr. Kok Ping Soon, Chief Executive, GovTech. Professor Tan, Professor Tan Eng Chai, President of NUS. Dr. Janil Puticherry, Senior Minister of State. Mr. Eng Ji Kun, Permanent Secretary and Chairman of GovTech. Mr. Kung Chan Meng, CEO of NUSISS. Now, earlier we had a chance to hear from Dr. Janil and Mr. Kung. Uh, we'd like to invite the uh, rest of our VIPs joining us for the launch to say a few words regarding the launch of the Digital Academy. Uh, perhaps we could start with uh, Mr. Ng Chi Khan. Sure. Uh, thanks, everybody, for attending this uh, launch and the festival. Uh, the Digital Academy is going to be a very important capability for the government. Uh, we, I thank all the partners who have worked very hard with us to reach today to be able to launch the uh, programs, but the, the real work uh, is ahead. Uh, we need to fundamentally transform the capabilities of our ICT workforce, uh, particularly 
but also to uplift the general capability in uh, across the digital technologies for all our public officers, including the senior members of the public service. So I look very much forward to uh, the Digital Academy uh, helping us to do this, uh, and it promises to be a really important capability uh, for the public service. Thank you. Thank you, Chikan. Uh, could we hear next from Professor Tan Eng Chai? Oh, thank you. Good morning. Congratulations to GovTech for opening this exciting new chapter in the digitization of our public service. Skills development is critical for our workforce, and I'm glad that the NUS ISS has been entrusted with the operations of this academy. My very best wishes to the Digital Economy. Academy. Thank you, Professor Tan. Certainly an exciting day for all of us. Uh, next up is Mr. Kok Ting Soon. Uh, thank you, Joe. Thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, today. And a uh, shout out to our operations partner, NUSISS, and our nine great content partners to join us in this uh, very unique enterprise to pull together the best in class to offer digital technology training to everyone. And my wish is that I hope every public officer will be able to experience at least one digital academy courses uh, over the next two years. And I hope that experience will positively transform them and equip them with the digital competencies they need in order for them to be more effective in delivering their work. Thank you very much, Ping Sun, and indeed, thank you, everyone. And the excitement is palpable in the team. There's a team behind the scenes scene scurrying right now, getting ready for the launch. Thank you all for being here and uh, witnessing the official launch. So we're about set to go, and on my cue, we will begin the countdown and get the launch going. So, ready, set, go! To be a smart nation and a digital government, we require all public service officers to be comfortable using digital technology. We also require public service leaders to have sufficient digital skills to lead in the digital transformation. Finally, we require our tech professionals to stay ahead of developments as technology evolves. We need to have the mindset to always improve, even if you feel that you are already at the highest level of proficiency. The Digital Academy will be an open platform where we can work with best-in-class industry partners depending on the technical specialisations. These courses are offered in partnership with leading academic institutions and training providers, including NUSISS, who is our operations partner, as well as AWS, Microsoft, Tableau, Secure Code Warrior, just to name a few, as our content partners. Skills development is the ultimate enabler of digital excellence. The Digital Academy leverages four decades of NUSISS experience in developing digital talent. With an open collaborative platform for the public service to lead the curve of digital excellence through practice-oriented and outcome-focused learning programs. Get ready to be immersed in a variety of learning platforms from the usual e-learning courses to the more interactive and hands-on sessions such as hackathons, workshops, learning journeys, mentorships and even attachments to private sector companies. I encourage all of us to embrace the mindset of being in constant beta and let's keep learning.
And with that, the Digital Academy is now officially launched. We're very thankful for the presence of all our VIPs and, of course, yourselves, our public service leaders and officers, in joining us for this momentous occasion. We'll now take a moment for a photo opportunity. I'd like to invite our five VIPs to please uh, keep our cameras on and stay on camera and smile. Uh, we'll now take a group photo, and uh, on my count, we're going to take a, a picture. Here we go. One, two, three. Great. I would like now to uh, go on to invite Janet Ang as well as our nine content partners to turn their cameras on so that we can have a group photograph as well. The group, of course, consists of Amazon Web Services, Coursera, Google, Microsoft, Click, Secure Code Warrior, Tableau, ThoughtWorks, and Singtel Trustwave. Uh, as you know, we're online today with a big group of supporters as well, and we're glad to see everyone on screen. So could we have a big smile as we take a group photograph for keepsakes? Here we go. One, two, three. Thank you very much. You know how the screenshot now has become the official photograph, right? Uh, we're going to take a break of about some 33 minutes or so, and when we return, the symposium will begin with two amazing keynote speakers. We have Dr. Patrick Teo, Head of Engineering for Payments, Next Billion Users, and Site Leader for Google Singapore, and Ms. Ng Wee Wei, Country Managing Director of Accenture Singapore. Now, after their keynote sessions, our speakers will be joined by Senior Minister of State, Dr. Janel Puticherry, for a dynamic panel discussion. We'll be back at 10.05. We'll see you soon.
Welcome back to the Digital Academy's Virtual Launch Symposium. I'm Joe Augustin, your MC. Now, we're pleased to bring you two intriguing keynote sessions this morning. Our first speaker is the Head of Engineering for Payments, Next Billion Users, and Site Leader for Google Singapore. Let's warmly welcome Dr. Patrick Teo. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, SMS Janil, for opening this symposium, and congratulations to GovTech and NUS ISS on the launch. I'm humbled by the invitation to share some thoughts about digital transformation and the responsibility that leaders have in support of this objective. But let me start by saying how much I appreciate the work that all of you are doing as you transform our government for the future. The COVID-19 pandemic has not only reinforced the importance of the public sector, it has shown how critical it is that we have a digitally equipped public sector. As we have seen, a well-structured technology system underpins everything from contact tracing to working and learning from home to making sure that information is disseminated effectively online. We at Google are proud to be working closely with the Singapore government as we continue to confront COVID's challenges and prepare for the unexpected. Our partnership today is wide ranging. It includes deploying Google's platforms to share the latest health and vaccine information to delivering travel insights to help us eventually open up our skies and economies and to making sure that individuals know how to stay safe online. We also work together on digital education and skills programs to help individuals skill up for careers in digital marketing or cloud technology. Through Google Pay, we support the advances in Singapore's digital payment system as part of our smart nation ambitions. Digital transformation underpins all these priorities and presents us with a wide range of opportunities. That's why today's event matters. And it's why all of us at Google and our cloud team in particular are so excited to be lending our support to the government's broader transformation agenda. Personally, I'm honored to be a small part of this effort as a Google executive and as a proud Singaporean. If there's a single thread that links my upbringing in Singapore, my time working in the US and my role at Google today, it is the belief in the power of technology to shape change for the better. When I was 12, my father bought me a TRS-80 Model 1 with four kilobytes of RAM. And from then on, I was hooked. I wrote programs to help him with his work as a quantity surveyor in the construction industry during my secondary school years, and then studied computer science in JC. Later on, I went to the US to continue studying computer science in university. When I graduated from university, the dot-com boom was beginning to take off and I was fortunate to be able to be part of it. I saw the power of digital technology in the various tech companies that I've been a part of. From a tech startup where we were helping to make the world a better place by helping people share life's joy through leveraging the transformation of photography from analog to digital, to working at Earth's most customer-centric company to bring digital music streaming to people wherever they may be, to giving people the power to build community and build, bring the world closer together. When I returned to Singapore, my team and I helped people save time and money for the important things in life by enabling Singaporeans to buy their groceries and household items online. Today, I'm part of the Google Pay team, where we believe that what we do unlocks economic opportunity for all. Using technology to improve the lives of people is common in the mission statements of all these companies. Our philosophy at Google is to put users first when building products and developing platforms. This is core of our mission, to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Universal being the key word. By putting users first, we hope to make the internet more inclusive, equitable, and helpful. I believe the sentiment behind the vision is something we share with the public sector and something that can be achieved with the right digital competencies in place. At Google, the work building for the next billion users goes to the heart of this ambition. 
These are people from countries like India, Indonesia, Nigeria, Brazil, Mexico, and many others. We believe that these people have the same right to access the internet and the opportunities it creates as anyone else. But we also know that the next billion users experience the internet differently. This is where having a user's first approach plays a very important role. Before we are able to build products and offer services to serve these new internet users, we have to understand who they are, what they need, and how they interact with digital technology and content. To do that, we need to stay close to these users, and Singapore provides us with a unique vantage point right at the center of one of the fastest growing and most dynamic digital economies in the world, Southeast Asia. Over the last five years, we've invested heavily in spending time with people in different tech environments, so we understand for ourselves how they experience and use technology. We have a sizable UX research team across Google that ensures product designs and decisions are optimized and that we're doing the right things for our users. They spend time with people in their immediate environment to gain insights on diversity and behavior. One of the biggest takeaways we had from this research is that building for the next billion users requires building from the ground up. We cannot simply customize an existing product that was created in Silicon Valley. The functions must be purposeful, the designs must be deliberate, and the product must be created with the intended users in mind. These principles have guided us in building products like Android Go, a mobile device operating system that works well with low memory devices while still giving users a full digital experience. We built Google Maps Online, offline, which allowed the next billion users to save places and directions in map and refer to them later when they're on the road without an internet connection. And now Maps Offline is used everywhere in the world. These principles have also been critical in evolving Google Pay, which we launched in Singapore last year. We started by focusing on the user and basing our products on three fundamental principles, that it must be simple, secure, and helpful. To make it simple, we focus on who users are and emphasize the relationships they have with people and businesses, instead of designing around bank accounts and transactions. We know that payments don't take place in isolation. They're part of the daily interactions you have with your friends, your family, and local businesses. And that is how we arrived at a conversational payments user experience design. Singapore is also the first country where Google Pay users can form groups to organize and manage payments, as well as split bills and other shared expenses within the app. We also worked with DBS, OCBC, and Standard Chartered to enable users to pay merchants and other users on Google Pay. This is done by integrating Google Pay with Singapore's national payments infrastructure using SGQR and PayNow, making it even easier for Singaporeans to incorporate Google Pay into their daily lives. To make it secure, we use state-of-the-art encryption on secure servers, implemented tokenization, and put in place passcode requirements, biometric authentication, and two-factor authentication. We want our users to be able to use Google Pay without worry. To make it helpful, we thought about small businesses. We created the order food feature where users can browse cuisines and order takeout from local restaurants and eateries and pay from the app. We worked with partners to provide a platform that simplifies the logistics of receiving orders and payments, which enhance our food merchants' operational efficiencies. For food merchants that are not integrated into Google Pay, we offered the menu discovery feature where users can browse their menu and contact them directly to make arrangements. In addition to ordering food, we also offered Singaporeans the convenience of booking and paying for movie tickets with our two largest local cinemas, providing a convenient digital experience for avid moviegoers. Digital technology enabled us to design Google Pay by putting users first. It further enabled us to amplify the impact of our efforts by collaborating with banks and merchants to build an ecosystem of businesses that would benefit users. The potential of digital technology to people, businesses, and government is significant. To seize the opportunity that digital technology presents us, we need our organizations to be equipped for digital transformation. As leaders, 
It is our responsibility to build a culture that encourages continuous learning, agility, and innovation. This will enable our organizations to maximize the potential that digital technology has to offer. At Google, this is a top priority for us too. Let me share with you some examples of how we're encouraging continuous learning at Google. First, we provide funding for self-driven learning. We offer an annual education reimbursement program for both job-related learning as well as personal learning. This includes taking degree courses or online courses, attending workshops or job-related conferences and seminars. It also includes taking language lessons for job-related reasons or simply for fun. Second, we run an employee-to-employee -employee network called G2G or Googler to Googler. This is a volunteer teaching network where Googlers dedicate a portion of their time to help peers learn and grow. Googlers can participate in a variety of ways from teaching courses, providing one-to-one -one mentoring to designing learning materials. This supports the community with learning opportunities, but also creates a sense of ownership within Google. Many of the popular classes focus on general professional skills like negotiation and leadership and role-related skills like sales training and coding. It has also helped upskill our employees in new areas. For example, as mobile computing on smartphones became increasingly popular years ago, thousands of Googler went through an Android training bootcamp run by the very Googlers who worked on Android. And third, we encourage innovation and learning through 20% projects. As some of you may have heard, this is a program where employees can spend 20% of their time working on what they think would benefit Google most. Some of our most interesting innovations were born out of 20% projects. In addition to providing an opportunity for innovation, Googlers also take advantage of the 20% programs to learn new skills. Googlers who are interested in a different role can choose to spend 20% of their time on a specific project with a different team. This enables the 20% Googlers to learn a few new skills while providing the host team some additional help. These are some of the ways we foster a culture of continuous learning here at Google. In closing, digital technology prevents, presents us with an immense opportunity. We can innovate and improve the products and services that we offer to our users, provide tools to empower employers, employees to do their jobs productively, while having a positive sense of well being and to have a positive impact on society at large. As leaders, we have a vital responsibility to enable our organizations to take advantage of digital technology by developing a culture and organization that encourages continuous learning, agility, and innovation. I'm excited to join you in launching GovTech's Digital Academy today as the public service upholds its tradition of continuous upgrading and growth. I also want to thank SMS Janil and the GovTech team for creating the Digital Academy where the industry can continue to closely collaborate and support the digital transformation of the public sector to build and design products and services that will benefit all Singaporeans. Thank you. Thank you very much. I love the idea of G2G, and I also love the fact that we both began our programming uh, business or big programming life with the TRS-80. Uh, you've just gone a lot further with it. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Teo. Now, our second keynote speaker is the Country Managing Director of Accenture Singapore and the Public Service Growth Markets Industry Lead. To deliver her keynote address, it's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Ng Wee Wei. Good morning. Dr. Janelle Puducherry, Senior Minister of State, Ministry of Communications and Information and Ministry of Health. Mr. Ng Chi Kun, Permanent Secretary, Smart Nation and Digital Government, Professor Tan Ing Chai, President, National University of Singapore, Professor Ho Te Hua, Senior Deputy President and Provost of NUS, Ms. Janet Ang, Chairman, Institute of System Science, NUS, Mr. Kok Ping Soon, Chief Executive, Government Technology Agency of Singapore, Mr. Kun Chao Ming, Chief Executive Officer, NUS, ISS, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is an honor to be invited to the launch of the Digital Academy. I think we can all agree 
the year 2020 has introduced one of the largest and fastest human behavior shifts in living memory. No adjective can even come close to explain the uncertainty we all feel and the adjustments we have to make. In the last 15 months, we have seen many organizations step up to use technology in extraordinary ways to keep their businesses and communities running at a pace they previously thought was impossible. Companies that were leaders pre-COVID are doubling down on their investments in technology. In May 2020, 50% of Singapore companies we surveyed in our Care to Do Better report said they are going to significantly increase investment in digital transformation. By July, it was 80%. While 80% of the Singapore workforce strongly believes their employer is responsible for helping them, only 25% of Singapore C-suite feel the same way. And only 18% of organizations plan to significantly increase spending to reskill their people over three years. What's in front of us is a once in a generation opportunity to turn this moment of truth for technology into a moment of trust. Embracing the power of exponential technology change to completely reimagine and rebuild the future of workforce and the human experience. So why is reimagining workforce important? The World Economic Forum predicts that by 2025, 50% of all employees will need reskilling. 85 million jobs may be displaced, but 97 million new ones may emerge. Industry convergence and disruptions have created new sources of value and forged new partnerships. According to our client, uh, our citizen experience in a digital age research, 88% of Singapore citizens want government agencies to work with the private sector to develop more innovative public services. These days, speed goes hand in hand with success. Organizations can't afford to wait and hire someone tomorrow to build the solution they need today. To drive a successful workforce transformation, both employees and organization leaders must change their mindset on how they approach talent development and collaboration across the ecosystem. After all, powerful technology capabilities such as RPA, low code platforms are now usable by people without highly specialized skills, thereby democratizing technology. This presents organizations with the possibility of teaching non-IT employees to think like technologists and put the skills gap in the past. As organizations move forward, individuals need to adapt quickly and be smart about the skills that will augment their existing skill sets, enabling them to keep up with the pace of change. The establishment of the digital academy makes learning more accessible and will go hand in hand with the change in mindset we need to embrace. So how can we tap on an entire village to raise a child? This is where the co-dependent relationship between organization, employees, and the ecosystem comes into play. All organizations, including public sector organizations, exist within the ecosystem. There are high interdependencies within the ecosystem when it comes to delivering citizen services and experience. Public agencies will have to evolve rapidly in response to changing citizen needs technology advancements, and other influences within the ecosystem. This in turn means that officers need to learn at speed, adopt new ways of working, and challenge themselves and push boundaries. In Accenture's Care to Do Better report, we have identified a net better off framework with six dimensions that leaders must focus on to unlock their people's potential. One of the key dimensions is employable. This means having marketable, in-demand capabilities and skills that make it easy to obtain good jobs and equitable career advancement opportunities. The responsibility of lifelong employability lies as much with the employee as the organization. Apart from empowering employees with learning platforms and reskilling opportunities, organizations must also redesign jobs to provide new levels of service. Learning is also not confined to the four walls of an organization. Other partners in the ecosystem can also be tapped on to provide employees with the opportunities to put newly gained knowledge into practice and reduce their learning curve with exposure to subject matter experts or practitioners. 
it could also create a greater flow and retention of talents amongst agencies as public offices build their extended network. It's important to keep in mind that 85% of Singapore employees whose employer makes continuous learning a priority are more likely to recommend the employer compared to 55% of those who don't. Now, let me share how Accenture has responded to rapid digitalization and transformed our own workforce at scale. As a firm that offers end-to-end -end services from strategy, consulting, interactive technology to operations, the type of work we do with our 6,000 clients across 120 countries often requires us to be at the forefront of change. 2014 was the year we embarked on a global upscaling of our internal capabilities to embrace digital, including rescaling over 160,000 employees to be conversant in new IT skills and more than 100,000 to be job ready within two years. Fast forward to today, we remain committed to enabling our people to be future ready. Each year, we invest around 1 billion US dollars in reskilling, training, and learning initiatives for our 537,000 employees in order to live up to our purpose of delivering on the promise of technology and human ingenuity. Our own digital and workforce transformation journey allows us to truly understand what's at stake and help other organizations as they go through their own journeys. In FY20, Accenture increased training hours for our people by 6% over FY19, whilst reducing cost by 11%, leveraging our digital learning platforms. We have programs such as Technology Quotient to help employees understand, talk about, and apply emerging technologies that together are changing the world in new ways every day. Over the last nine months, our employees in Southeast Asia alone had completed over 27,000 online courses. Apart from the learning programs, our people build skills through projects, and they get to define the areas they aspire to specialize in. Using data, we match our people to new projects that leverage their experience and new skills gain, whilst also tapping on adjacent skills that our people have. We also use data to identify shifts in skills and expertise required in the work we do with clients so that our people can gain the skills and build experience early on. As mentioned earlier, building the future workforce is beyond any one organization. We're committed to building the future workforce within the Singapore ecosystem. We actively participate in government programs such as IMDA TESA to reskill and develop tech professionals in cybersecurity, data protection, data science. We're also partnering SAP, Skills Future Singapore, and Tomasic Polytechnic in the SG United Mid Career Pathways program to upskill and reskill mid-career job seekers for jobs in growth industries like the tech sector. The Accenture example is a showcase of how large organizations have an important role in helping our workforce become future ready. In recent years, organizations in private and public sectors have started prioritizing reskilling their workforce at scale and with speed as the pace of change increases. As Singapore's largest employer, the government, can certainly accelerate the transformation of our future workforce. The impetus for continuous reinvention is the many interactions citizens have with public services each day and the impact that the largest workforce in Singapore can make. Employees' expectations have changed too. Public services are at the forefront of the COVID-19 pandemic response. While those who work in the public sector have always been driven by purpose and mission, Many feel a renewed sense of this and are proud of the work that they, their colleagues and their organizations are doing. According to our survey, 50% of those who had been a part of a public service agency but have left would consider rejoining out of a sense of civic duty and a desire to contribute to society. Leaders would do well to build up this renewed sense of purpose to reimagine an enhanced employee experience within public service agencies build greater resilience by doing things differently, leveraging on scalable technology and change perception of what government does through innovation and delivery in new ways. The times of crisis teach us things we didn't know about ourselves and presents a once in a lifetime opportunity to define the future. As leaders, there are three key actions you can take. One, rethink essential skills to enable lifelong employability. 
the pandemic has taught us the taught us the importance of adaptability, flexibility, and the ability to work well amid uncertainty. These are now essential superhero skills for your workforce. Improve performance across your organizations by valuing these traditionally overlooked soft skills, developing learning programs to cultivate them and re recruiting for them. By placing equal importance on developing soft and digital skills, employees can become versatile and develop greater resiliency to future disruptions. Two, deconstruct and reconstruct roles and teams. Post pandemic, no one is going back to work as they remember it. As the public service looks ahead and maps out their workforce in the new, the functions and processes will naturally shift, jobs need to be redesigned and individual roles reimagined with technology augmenting individual performance. Three, use data to uncover new tech opportunities. Data are extremely useful in helping to identify skills adjacencies, which can help fill in-demand roles as well as ease employees' transition into new roles. Use data-driven insights to identify trends in the workforce, such as future skills, and act on them. Taking a whole government approach and sharing data on available skills or resources can also go a long way to increase talent mobility across the public agencies, giving employees the opportunities to diversify skill sets, speed up digitalization, strengthen appreciation of different agencies' role, and create a whole new level of connectivity in a more sustainable manner. In conclusion, the Digital Academy is a step in the right direction. There are things that individuals and organizations can do to complement the objective of the Academy. I'm excited to see how the Digital Academy will evolve and en enable the public service workforce in the new. As leaders, you all have a role to play to build digitally conf confident offices. Work as we know it has changed. No one knows exactly what the future will look like, but we do know what workers need to thrive anywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Wei Wei, for your in-depth sharing. We're very excited about our next segment, which is the panel discussion. Now, this session will explore, explore how individuals, leaders, and ecosystem have all a role to play in the digital transformation journey of an organization. For this panel discussion, we'll have with us Dr. Janil Puducherry, Senior Minister of State, Ministry of Communications and Information of Singapore, and our two keynote speakers you heard earlier, Dr. Patrick Teo from Google Singapore. And Ms. Ng Weiwei from Accenture Singapore. Now, this segment is moderated by Mr. Dian Prasad, Senior Director of Strategy, People and Organization at GovTech. Now, all of you are up for what promises to be a fascinating panel discussion on the topic of raising the digital quotient in public service. So, Dr. For, for Mr. Dian Prasad, when you're ready. Thank you, Joe. Uh, and uh, morning, everybody, again. SMS Janil, uh, Weiwei, Patrick, a very warm welcome to all of you to the panel. I'd like to start by thanking all of you for your respective talks earlier today, the opening address by SMS Janil and the keynotes by Patrick and Weiwei. In sharing your perspectives and providing food for thought, you have already nudged us in the right direction of strengthening the learning culture to be on a journey in a continuum to stay relevant and create impact. There are a few personal takeaways from these talks for me. SMS call to action, not just in applying our learning to our respective roles, but also in transferring skills to our teams. As they say, we learn more as we teach. Patrick talked about the belief in the power of tech to change the world for the better. Patrick also spoke about the power of building communities and approaching with a user-first uh, mentality. Then Weiwei spoke about the largest and the fastest behavioral shift that we are noticing, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that we have to change the moment of truth to a moment of trust. All these were very powerful insights, and thank you again. While I was preparing for this panel, I came across an interesting quote from a CEO of an ideation platform in the US who said, 
don't be fooled by some of the digital transformation buzz out there. Digital transformation is a business discipline or a company philosophy and just not a project. The quote provides a good segue for my very first question. I'd like to hear thoughts from all of you. I'll start with SMS Janil and followed by Vive and Patrick. So the question is, what in your perspective characterizes a digital organization? Is it industry specific or agnostic? And finally, a question that a lot of us would have in our minds, do you need to be a born native to be digital? SMS Janil, I'll start with you, sir. Thanks, Prasad. All, all the evidence suggests that the answer to your last question is no, and that we can learn how to do this. Uh, I, and I think my, my fellow panelists will have lots of interest and, and lots of examples as to how this is so, that people who are not born a digital native can uh, very easily uh, adopt many of these tools and practices. And I would count myself uh, in that uh, uh, in that category. I was uh, well past working adulthood when I got my first internet connection, let alone my first mobile phone. So uh, I uh, embraced these things uh, quite wholeheartedly. But when it comes to an organization, I would suggest that um, th there are some commonalities that uh, straddle whether the private sector or the public sector, whether you, your mission is profit driven or uh, you know, on behalf of the public good. And even within those categories, uh, many different types of organizations. I would say there are a handful of things where you can find some commonalities about what we what we mean when we talk about a digital organization and that process of digital transformation. I would say uh, in no particular order, one is a commitment to um, basing your optimization and your transformation process as an organization around the opportunities afforded by technology. And this includes process transformation. In other words, forcing yourself to think through some of the logical structures as a result of using technologies about efficiency gains, about productivity, about user experience. I would say the second is uh, an increasing appreciation of uh, a quantitative analysis uh, using data, again, in both your customer facing as well as your internal process facing and your, and your, and your decision making. And I think this is especially so for the public sector um, uh, a shift around digital transformation. And I would say the third is that embracing of um, the ag agile iterative uh, process, uh, that some of this transformation allows you to really shorten some of your time horizons and your, your planning horizons so that you can move quickly, iterate repeatedly, learn from the lessons and, and build on those successes. I think those are uh, both generic enough and applicable enough to many of our organizations that they cut across this entire spectrum. Thanks, Prasad. Thank you, Ms. Janet. Uh, Vive, uh, could we hear from you, please? Yes, thank you. Um, I think to us, digital, um, digital organization is a matter of survival. So in our 2013 annual report, right, where we had a tech vision, which we publish every year, in 2013, we said, every organization is a digital organization. And I think when we said that, we were probably a bit ahead of our time. But during this pandemic, right, many organizations stepped up and because of their rapid tech adoption, 30% of companies expect to return to pre-COVID levels of revenue growth in 2021. And another 30% expect to do so in 2022. So really what separates right, a digital organization is what separates leaders from laggards. Right? Digital laggards are companies who have postponed their digital transformation and lack the foundation they need to rapidly pivot during the pandemic. And these companies have a rude awakening because in our research, we found that the top 10% of companies in any industry who are using technology most effectively were outperforming the rest by a factor of two. But now this gap has widened. The top 10% are outperforming laggards by five times. So really it is not a, a choice anymore. It's not what suits which company and which industry, it's a matter of survival. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, Patrick? Thank you, Prasad. Uh, well, digital organizations are organizations that leverage digital technology in serving their customers, managing and growing their business, but also empowering their employees and connecting with their partners. Uh, as we mentioned, um, especially with COVID, digital technology has become even more important uh, for people, for businesses, and for government. I believe that any organization can succeed as a digital 
um, organization, as long as it keeps learning. Even the digital native as Google um, needs to keep evolving. When Google started over 20 years ago, it was a website to help users search for information. Since then, there have been an emergence of multiple new digital technologies. Websites became web applications. People have access to smartphones and now are always connected. And AI is increasingly being used. Even as a cloud native organization, in the short 22 years that Google has been in existence, it is a vastly different time now. As such, even Google Teams need to continue to learn and take advantage of new digital technologies. Uh, in fact, Googlers also use the courses that our cloud team is making available to the GovTech Digital Academy. Now to harness the enormous potential of uh, digital technologies, organizations need to consider three essential building blocks. And some of this has been echoed by SMS Janine. First, it should strive to be user-centric and inclusive at its heart. Digital technology enables us to reinvent the user experience and put users first. But we need to remember that users are at various stages of adopting digital technology, so it's vital to be inclusive. Second, as echoed by SMS Janil, it's important that digital organizations be agile and innovative. Digital technology enables us to respond quickly to emerging needs and preferences, and the pandemic has shown how digital technology has, can be deployed quickly to save lives. Our organizations need to be to take advantage of this by being agile and innovative. And finally, it's critical that organizations embrace continuous learning. This pace of change of digital technology itself is so rapid that even digital organizations can become out of date. So um, to ensure that we continue to take advantage of digital technologies, organizations need to develop a culture of continuous learning. Now, I believe that digital organizations that excel at these three attributes will benefit disproportionately over those who don't because digital technology is essentially a force multiplier for these attributes. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. You know, uh, something that comes up to me very strongly, a headline, if you will, from listening to all three of you, is that the thing that's transforming is not technology, but technology is transforming us. Uh, and then, you know, some of the repeated messages that I heard were around building a community or an ecosystem. Uh, it's about uh, being agile as an organization, uh, continuous learning, uh, iterative innovation, user experience, which is also inclusive. Uh, that brings me to my next question. Uh, contrary to popular belief, and here's again something that I would like to hear thoughts from all of you. Contrary to po popular belief, uh, the digital transformation is less about technology like we were just sharing and more about people. The digital future depends on developing next generation capabilities, closing the gaps between talent supply and demand, and dual focus on knowledge for hard skills and potential for soft skills, uh, for example, intellectual curiosity. They're all considered critical in this journey. So we would like to welcome your thoughts from your own experiences and organizational practices of what is required and essential beyond just technology and specifically from a people and culture focus in an organization. Uh, Patrick, I'll start with you. Sure, thank you, Prasad. I couldn't, I wholeheartedly agree, and I'm glad you brought this up. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, digital technology changes very quickly, and we need to equip people to keep up, but actually more importantly, to thrive and take advantage of these changes. Um, a thriving digital organization isn't one that only has the necessary digital competencies and capabilities, but one that has the right culture that can empower its employees to innovate and take advantage of digital technology. We believe that um, in Google, a few of these key attributes lead to high performing teams and an innovative culture uh, at Google. To build such a culture, um, amongst many things, first we need to start with a shared vision. Digital technology en enables us to tackle big problems, but we need a shared vision so that the teams can work together to bring together their collective skills towards the shared vision. Second, it's really important to create an environment with psychological safety. As SMS Janil uh, mentioned earlier, this is about learning from failures and encouraging teams to take risks and experiment with new ideas. One example of how we do this at Google is what we call blameless postmortems. When we encounter undesirable outcomes, we collectively identify the root causes without assigning blames to individuals or teams, but instead focus on learnings and actionable solutions. These postmortems are written and shared broadly 
because we view this as a learning opportunity, not, for the not only for the individuals involved, but for the entire company. Third, we need to have a culture that's comfortable with uncertainty and embraces change. At Google, amongst many things, we call this Googliness. There are several aspects to Googliness, and part of this uh, is to thrive in ambiguity, to value feedback, and to be able to effectively challenge the status quo. We encourage this amongst Googlers, as well as look for this in people we hire. For digital native organizations, as well as organizations undergoing digital transformation, in addition to developing digital capabilities and skilling its workforce, it's equally important, as you mentioned, to develop a culture that can take advantage of these digital technologies and innovate. Patrick, thank you. We may, uh, your thoughts on this question. I actually think you, you just summarized my speech with the question. <laughs> but but uh, I think from another angle, most organizations actually have a multi-generation workforce. And, and therefore, I think one of the key words I like to bring out in this question is that we need to be inclusive, right? We've seen, and, and it's possible, we've seen employees across generations embrace digital. It is really about the mindset and being open to learn. So I talked about the democratization of technology because that's true. People without highly specialized skills can now create a custom dashboard, right? To get insights from the data that they have. So whether is it a technology quotient or digital quotient, I really believe that these programs need to be designed to be broad-based in order to uplift capabilities across all spectrums of employees. Thank you, Vipi. Uh, SMS Janil, uh, your views on it, and, and do you see it being any different in the government? Well, well I hope it's less, diff less different than people imagine, you know, and uh, I think the, the cultural aspects that both uh, Patrick and Weiwei spoke about are just as important for uh, public sector agencies to think about and to embrace. And I think one aspect of that is uh, having some sense of uh, reality about just how out of date any individual's uh, familiarity with the technology is. Uh, I mean, I mean it, it, the, the space is moving so fast and the complexity is increasing so significantly that uh, you almost need to assume that uh, you're out of date when you come to the table, you know, and you need that team of people uh, to work together to say, well, what is the best possible uh, solution for this? I mean, the truth is, even in an organization like GovTech, and I'm and I, you know, I'm sure I, uh, my, my, my fellow panelists will have a similar experience. You know, the, the one team is not up to speed with what all the other teams are doing and the technologies that you are concentrating on. Not every, you assume that nobody outside the room quite appreciates the nuance of what you can do. Uh, so if, if for public sector agencies, especially, if you are looking to then refresh your business process, optimize uh, your, your engagements with your customer base, uh, or even something as basic as redesigning a website or an app. Um, and you know, you come and ask me, what's the best way to do it? Actually, my answer is going to be, I don't know. I'm going to go and speak to a variety of people in GovTech and some external partners, and maybe we can try to come up with some kind of solution, not only just optimize for today, but perhaps build in some future proofing. If you come to me and tell me, I'm telling you that what I need your engineers to build, I, I have to politely explain to you, you know, I, I think you... You are, you are maybe trying to choose from a menu that's a few months old, you know, never mind about future proofing. And so it is that sense that it's a little bit exhausting. Uh, it leaves you a little bit out of breath, you know, to imagine that you're so out of date all the time. But actually, that's embracing the pace of digital transformation. To assume that you need to think three or four steps ahead in terms of where the technology is going and uh, that your knowledge today may be a little bit out of date. And I think if you take that mindset, many of these cultural factors making sure your people continually learn, making sure you keep your skills and insights up to date, making sure that you have the tools embedded within your various products and processes to tell you what works well and what doesn't work well, making sure that you have the organizational process to then go and change things when they need to, I think, uh, fall out from that mindset if you if you adopt that uh, and embrace that. Thanks, Prasad. Thank, thank you, SMS. A um, couple of key uh, takeaways for me. I think uh, Patrick's mention of uh, this phrase uh, where he said uh, blameless uh, postmortem, I think that really stood out and you know, speaks to our uh, uh, value of assuming good intent when we get into uh, conversations and when we get into our learning journey. And then uh, we may spoke about uh, how uh, we are dealing with a multi-generational workforce and therefore we, we need to take everybody along. You know, like someone said, 
uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, take everyone along. That message is coming along very strongly. And uh, SMS, your your uh, phrase of uh, individuals famili familiarity with tech that that stood out, and that actually is a good segue to my next question, which I have for Patrick. Uh, Patrick, in tech world, and I think all of you mentioned this earlier, the uh, skills will get obsolete very quickly. The half-life of skills that we're talking about is less than two years. Uh, your own experience, you shared a little bit of it from spending nights stamping envelopes in your first startup with Shutterfly to building Amazon's music service to building products for the next billion users at Google. How have you equipped yourself with time as an engineer and as a tech leader across orgs and across geographies to evolve and stay ahead of the curve? How have you focused on learning to specialize or learning to grow? Thanks for the question, uh, Prasad. Um, I'm happy to share. Um, like businesses, um, individuals need to stay relevant with their skills and experience. I think we've echoed that um, uh, for the last couple of minutes. Um, as we talked about earlier, digital technology changes rapidly and in individuals like digital organizations need to have a mindset of continuous learning and skill development individuals as well as um, digital organizations. Um, you asked about you know, what has changed uh, you know, as I uh, progressed from uh, an engineer to you know, being a business leader. Well, what, is what has changed really has been the role that technology plays in each of these roles. As an engineer, I concern myself with mastering various programming languages, software development tools, best practices, and different application domains. As you progress, um, becoming a team lead and people manager, my focus was identifying, um, and in some cases building, the best tools, best, best practices to enable my team to be skilled and productive. Now, as a tech and business leader, my focus is now on identifying the right technologies that drive innovation and solve business needs, but also building organizations to take advantage of digital technologies. Now, the pace of digital technology advancements will only accelerate. We've, we will see multiple major leaps in technology across one's career, one's 30 to 40 year career. So it will be necessary for many to develop multiple specializations over one's career. And this sometimes involves taking risks. When I started uh, at Shutterfly in 1999, um, we observed that there was this transition from analog to digital photography. We used to have these film cameras. At the same time, broadband adoption was picking up and websites were starting to be web applications. And so we built this online service for users to upload their digital photos and have prints and photo products uh, mailed back to them. So at that time, the skill was how to build interactive web applications. Uh, so I spent about 10 years building the technology and the business with my team. But I noticed that new technology, new digital technology was advancing in other parts of the industry. So I took a risk, left my comfortable position and joined Amazon to build their digital music streaming service. And at that time, the first iPhone and Android devices were being released. And so we thought that you know, smartphones with good connectivity could double up as your music player. So we built mobile apps. We built apps uh, on your smartphones. We built apps uh, on connected devices like the Amazon Echo, Amazon TV. And we also built backends with cloud computing, which was also coming up at the same time. One thing to re remember that it is not only about technology and hard skill. It's also about how to lead and manage teams that use these digital technologies. I think SMS Janil uh, mentioned this, but in some ways we have to mirror how the, the op, how we almost have to follow how technology uh, um, evolves and manage our teams accordingly. And obviously, more recently, I joined Google Pay because I saw that countries around the world are seeing benefits uh, of digital payments and financial services and investing heavily. And with that, I launched uh, Google Pay in Singapore that not only enables users to pay contactless with their credit and debit cards but to also pay friends and merchants using our country's national rails, SGQR and PayNow. And as part of this new role, taking advantage of my experience, I also learned about digital payments and national payment infrastructure. So in, in conclusion, my personal experience has taught me that continuous learning, agility, and risk-taking, these are as relevant to individuals as, the, in career, uh, as individuals in a career in digital technology as they are to digital organizations. 
So there's a lot of mirror uh, between what an individual needs to do as well as uh, what a digital organization also needs to do. Thank you. Thank you so much for the insights. I'll move uh, to Weiwei for my next question. And uh, we discussed with Patrick about the role of an individual and, and uh, their role as a leader of uh, the team. Uh, Weiwei, with you, I wanted to focus a little bit on teams and organizations. You did speak about the famed talent transformation journey that started in Accenture in 2014. And at a global scale, 160,000 people being uh, uh, impacted positively with that transformation. Uh, you not only transformed your organization to be digitally native, and now you also help your client organizations in their journey. Uh, with a specific focus on teams and organizations, can you share with the audience today about the two or three most important focus areas that you had to get right and that Accenture focused on uh, in this journey? Thank you, Prasad, for the question. I think globally, we set a business aspiration to become the leading provider of end-to-end -end digital related services. And this required a massive talent transformation. So new scaling our people was at the heart of that transformation to ensure that they remain relevant and at the forefront of both technology and industry. And this is also part of our broader promise to help our people be successful, both professionally and personally, and it's a critical part of our talent strategy. But it hasn't been easy because at Accenture, we're very diverse. We have diverse talent profiles, and you add to that over 100 acquisitions, and therefore we have culture of cultures. But to us, the diversity is a source of strength, so promoting diversity building what we call a truly human company in the digital age, and creating an environment where our people can feel safe, supported, and thrive in is what we work to achieve. And that's how I think we managed to make that transition that we talked about. Thank you, Vivek. As, as you were sharing that, a uh, couple of thoughts you know, that come to my mind. When you're talking about culture of cultures, uh, that's very similar to uh, you know, what, what we see uh, in, in say GovTech or even in the larger public service in, in Singapore, there is a lot of familiar similarity there. And second one is when you're talking about focusing personally and professionally, uh, it, it's a bit of an approach that we take at GovTech as well. We often say that we are responsible for your lifetime employability and not lifetime employment. So there is a focus on developing them to be truly strong professionals irrespective of where they are. And of course, you know, do everything right as an organization to retain them to be with GovTech or to be with the government. Uh, with, uh, with that, I'd come uh, to SMS Janel with my next question. And here, wanted to focus a little bit on leadership and community. Uh, studies say that leadership, good or bad, cascades down to impact every single aspect of the organization. And sometimes with a 50% variability in performance attributed to an individual leader, in some ways, SMS Janel, government plays the role of a leader in the country. How do you see the role of a leader in digital and workforce transformation? And in, uh, everyone has been talking about bringing a village together, or bringing an ecosystem or community together. What can we learn from or contribute to private sector in making, uh, making a public-private uh, partnership a compelling community? Yeah, thanks, Prasad. Uh, you know, it's an important role that we play. And uh, I think... Uh, you, you have to appreciate the history and all the speeches this morning made reference to the start of the National Computerization Board in 1981. And uh, so when we look at where we are today and, you know, if you have any sense that, uh, well, actually, maybe this is good enough or we don't have to go quite so fast anymore or we've got there, uh, I, I would say no. And, and part of the reason why I would say no is that you must appreciate we are where we are today because from 1981 until now, uh, government has been pushing for this, uh, often causing some discomfort, you know, that we have to move and transform and change and don't just accept the status quo because we're trying to then anticipate the needs for the future. Uh, and I think that's a very important role for the public sector to take, uh, to demonstrate both the, the, the leadership imperative to drive for change, but also then uh, hold up the examples of benefit from doing so and explain and, and bring people along this journey that in, in engaging in this transformative process, it will benefit our missions, our tasks, our organizations, and ultimately our people. Uh, another role that I think that's a very important in terms of uh, 
government leadership is clearly we uh, have a, both a regulatory as well as a development and policy roles around some key aspects of digital life for people. Uh, and clearly, while we want the, the, the private sector and companies and enterprises to get involved and produce consumer offerings, uh, how we regulate those spaces, how we build some of the um, interfaces and the interoperability standards uh, will have a very real impact on how people embrace the uh, benefits of this digital transformation. And we can say all we like, but if it, if it ends up that your, your daily transactions or your daily interactions are difficult and painful and full of friction, you, you are not going to get the message. And so we have to, we have to do the legwork as well to, to remove some of, these, uh, some of these issues. And then thirdly, in terms of leadership, in terms of the partnerships that we develop, um, and especially how we um, role model the kind of relationships that we have with the private sector, both at GovTech on behalf of the rest of public sector and the, our various public sector agencies. And so it's, it's great that actually we can say hand on heart, we didn't come from 1981 to now because the government said it and did it. We may have said it, but actually it was the whole of Singapore, private individuals and private sector enterprises and companies and people from outside who've invested and developed their products here, multinationals, that we have come along this journey together. And many of our uh, key provisions for public sector digital products and services actually are commercial products and or developed in partnership with the private sector. But adhering to a certain vision of interoperability and citizen access and digital transformation, which I think then uh, sets the tone for where we might go as a country. So I think these are some of the aspects that uh, government has to play an important role in community leadership. But I think one of the things that has shifted in the last few years, which we should pay a little bit more attention to, uh, the, the good news is that uh, you know, people have got a lot more interest and a lot more sense of what works for, as a digital product. They compare, uh, you know, how, how, what their Google search is like compared to what their government search is like and, or their payment transaction from one platform to the other. And, and they understand what's happening and, and they want to say, uh, that requires a shift in the public sector for a different type of leadership to build, bring people in to be part of the building and development process. And, you know, the cliche is co-creation. But I think it's very real and it requires a new set of leadership skills that the public sector can and I think has effectively developed over the last few years. And we can put that into play for this next bound of transformation about involving our citizens in building smart nation together. Uh, and well, that sets a slightly different tone and I think it's a shift in the correct direction. Thank you, Ms. Janu. Uh, there, there were three key messages that I took away from uh, listening to all of you. And before I move to my next segment, I just wanted to share this. Uh, think big, start small, act fast is coming up very frequently. The second one is uh, the biggest part of the digital transformation is actually the change in mindset. And the third is, that we cannot delegate digital transformation specifically when it comes to a leadership team. Uh, it's absolutely essential that the leadership team owns it. They engage, adopt, and adapt to the new ways of working, new technology. And like SMS Janel said, take the team along and the team could be internal to the organization or the users or the citizens in our case. Uh, with that, uh, I wanted to move to the next segment. And again, this is, uh, a set of questions where I wanted to hear from all of you. Uh, we'll start with Patrick for the first one. Patrick, you did mention G2G already, and, and that's I know it's legendary from a Google perspective and spoken about, written about a lot. Uh, similar to that, is, is there a unique learning platform or intervention that you've seen in your career which contributes to a strong learning culture and a culture of continuous development? Thanks for the question, Prasad. Um, I can say a little bit more about G2G and I'll share another Please. program Please that do. we have uh, uh, at Google as well. So for those of you who uh, may not know, uh, G2G or Googler to Googler program, it's a peer-to-peer -peer learning program where Googlers can design a course and teach other Googlers uh, a specific professional development skill or simply a topic that they are passionate about. Uh, through G2G, we scale learning for Googlers across the globe. Uh, these topics that I mentioned could be professional skills like coding, but they could also be you know, fun topics like cooking, uh, especially in the, in the pandemic. There are actually a number of cooking classes available on G2G. Uh, it could also be you know, um, leadership, negotiation skills, or you know, 
how to uh, promote inclusion within our culture. Really, that's quite a broad range of uh, courses that are being taught by Google and, and made a lot of adoption. We started this GTT program actually uh, more than slightly more than 10 years ago, uh, and it has grown pretty significantly. Uh, most recently, over 10,000 Googlers actively volunteer to share knowledge and, and their passions through this program. And now this, uh, I know because of these 10,000 Googlers, this actually accounts for a significant portion of all learning at Google across functions and different content types. Um, to embed this learning uh, culture, uh, we actually include uh, community contributions such as GPG as a component of our appraisal process. Because doing this uh, helps Googlers know that we recognize the value and the time that they place on, on these contributions uh, and, and the value in general that we place on learning. Uh, I do believe that many organizations can adopt such a GPG program uh, because it can start small as ours did and grow as the culture embraces continuous learning. The other example I wanted to share um, in addition to GPG of how we foster learning is what we call bungee assignments. Um, these are actually short-term development opportunities. It's about six to 12 months and um, the commitment could be 20 to 100%. So you could work full-time for six months at, in a team or you know, 20 to 100%. It's called a bungee because you're jumping to another team without transferring. And so you stay in your current role uh, such that when you are done with your assignment, you get back. Uh, to your original team. Um, so obviously this came about uh, you know, as a way for the host team to have more resources in a short-term project or if they have a team member on extended leave. But this bungee uh, program actually provides Googlers an opportunity to gain new experience and stretch their abilities. In my own team, um, when we were about to launch Google Pay in Singapore, we were fortunate to have a bungee from a staffing organization our Bungie's role in staffing was to hire engineers, but she wanted to hone her program management skills. So with the support of a manager, um, she joined the Google Pay team for six months to help with program management. So this opportunity not only enabled her to deepen her program management skills, but also eventually gave her a deeper understanding of product development, which in turn becomes useful when she's recruiting engineers. So G2G uh, empowers Googlers to build a community of learning. While the Bungie program actually supports learning by doing, in both cases, they provide you know, one of uh, two of many uh, opportunities for Googlers to develop and grow and help reinforce this idea of continuous learning. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bungie and G2G, both really interesting uh, practices there. Vive, anything that stands out for you from, from your own experience? Uh, to me, organizations need to provide multiple pathways to learn. So if I were to think back, when I started in Accenture, that was uh, Anderson Consulting, learning was a very structured process. So I go to our corporate college in the US every career milestone to pick up skills for the next phase of my career. We, we say, we call that leaders teaching leaders, right? And I remember we used to do green books because the covers were green, that we need to do as part of our learning curriculum right, in order to finish that training uh, program. But that kind of learning today is really too linear, right, for the world we live in now. And today in Accenture, we acknowledge that one size of learning does not fit all. In fact, we don't even have a monopoly to all things that must be learned. So a few years back, we actually launched the, the learning board, which allows us to formally follow leaders in the organization to learn about emerging topics. And these leaders will curate the learning contents to help people approach these topics uh, more easily. And the learning board then augments all the formal training and the partner certification that we still have. And that kind of provides multiple pathways for people to learn. Thank you. SMS Janil, a practice that uh, you have really liked or appreciated. Oh, uh, it's hard to single one out. Um, I, uh, as you know, <laughs> I feel like I'm a, on a continuous learning journey, whether I like it or not. Uh, every every briefing that I get from uh, my civil service colleagues uh, is filled with new information that I had not yet encountered. Uh, but but I think the uh, the the issue of a learning culture is the thing that I appreciate most. That everybody is learning together, and hence there is no embarrassment uh, 
when you say, hey, tell me about this because I don't know. Uh, uh, and I think that's really, really important, you know, because whether you talk about it from a tech perspective or the larger organizational perspective, uh, that, that pace as well as the depth uh, of, of informational change is so great that you need to not be embarrassed. And I think that starts at the top. Uh, and when 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 the leadership is willing to say, I don't know about this, can you please tell me? Uh, that sends the right kind of message when when then you you show that you are able to imbibe that and then make it a positive outcome for you personally, but also a positive outcome for for your uh, teams. Uh, so that that's been uh, something I've appreciated. Every every time I have these uh, formal briefings as well as these informal meetings with GovTech engineers, it kind of uh, my, I feel slightly fried inside my my neurons, you know, because they're they're trying to download quite a lot of information uh, that I'm trying to I'm, and I'm hoping to imbibe to be useful. But uh, I come away reassured that uh, at least they 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 believe that they are teaching me something. I hope I am learning the right things, you know, and and try and be useful thereafter. Thank you, Mr. General. Uh, I think the message was very clear. There's no shame in displaying intellectual curiosity. And that's where the questions come from. And you know, uh, the willingness to say, I don't know something and I'm willing to learn here. Thank you. Uh, Ms. General, I'll start with you my next question. Uh, in, in the panel today, we have uh, the ecosystem represented. Uh, you know, uh, our content partners, uh, Accenture, which is also an IT vendor partner for us in the government and in GovTech and in you as our minister in charge. So if I were to ask you uh, about one expectation that you would have or a demand you would have on an initiative like uh, the Digital Academy, uh, a WOG initiative, what would that be? I think, uh, I, well, <laughs> you want me to set, set expectations and we're just at the day of launch. Uh, this I like, this I like. We, we are getting off to a good start. Uh, well, I think if, uh, if the Digital Academy is going to, uh, in a way, believe its founding myths, shall we say, then I, one expectation would be that two or three years from now, uh, your courses should be different. Your offerings should be different. You must have morphed and adapted. Uh, and if you have the same content and the same curriculum and the same process and nothing has changed, uh, then as a learning institution yourself, uh, you haven't quite uh, held yourself up to that standard. Uh, so I think that would be very important because then the participants, the public sector officers that come along uh, know that what they're experiencing today is for today. And when, if they come back two or three years later or five years later, there will be some continual benefit and it's a rolling ongoing process. And for that, the Digital Academy itself needs to be a learning institution and needs to be constantly adapting and transforming itself. We hear you, SMS. Uh, Patrick, any, uh, any expectations from you? What would you ask the Digital Academy to focus on and then uh, be mindful of? Yeah, um, I think uh, I looked up a stat um, before this uh, uh, panel. And um, you know, according to the IMDA's Digital Acceleration Index, um, two thirds of MNCs and one third of SMEs in Singapore felt that they were only digitally literate. Um, and there's still a lot of ways to go behind the category of digital leaders where IMDA are defined as digital cap capabilities uh, embedded to all functions. So you know, one expectation is that we see a movement um, of this uh, index uh, as a result of the digital academy. And the reason is that you know, the digital academy, uh, which is you know, part of the Singapore government uh, and 153,000 strong organization is setting the stage in terms of leadership by creating a skilled digital uh, uh, workforce. And this will also set the bar for businesses and industries to make digital capabilities ubiquitous all, uh, across all functions. So I'm you know, uh, optimistic, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, industries and businesses um, digitize um, uh, as you know, following the lead of the government. I think the other thing that, uh, that would be good to see is that learning is uh, not only uh, available uh, through the digital economy, uh, digital academy, it's actually there are many uh, digital ecosystems and digital learning systems in Singapore and Google contributes to a number of them. So, um, for example, uh, one of the programs is our cloud onboards program, where you know you can uh, attend free interactive training and cover Google Cloud fundamentals and key concepts and solutions. So, the other thing that I'm hopeful of uh, is that these communities will have more uh, Singaporeans uh, from the public sector as well as the private sector attending them, and 
So uh, in short, what I hope to see is that the Digital Academy will raise the bar um, across the whole of Singapore, not just government, but across the rest of the industry. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Weibei? I think a very similar point of view because you are the government, you are the largest employer. Please do not ask, underestimate the impact you can have to uplift the entire economy in Singapore. So I think now civil servants armed with you know, the newfound confidence in your digital quotient, please go out there and reinvent citizen service delivery. And therefore, it will serve as an example for the community in the lead and to challenge service providers to government to also embrace digital and, and really you know, create what's new. Thank you, Vivi. Uh, you know, we, we had you all express your expectation of the Digital Academy. I'm going to shift the focus a little bit. Uh, in our audience today, we have our public service officers, tech professionals in public service, leaders and ecosystem partners alike. So uh, may I request all of you for your famous last, last words for the audience. Uh, I'll start with Vivek. My famous last words, um, embrace learning, uh, leverage the power of the ecosystem and reimagine your career. Thank you, uh, Patrick. Yeah, I'd like to say that um, we have an immense opportunity to improve the lives of people, grow businesses through digital technology. Digital technology enables us to put users first and build an inclusive digital future for everyone. It enables organizations to work together to amplify their efforts. But what is needed are organizations that promote continuous learning, agility, and innovation. So we at Google are excited to be part of today's uh, launch at uh, GovTech's Digital Academy and look forward to working with all of you and looking forward to seeing the results. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, SMS Janan. Thank you all for your commitment to public service. Uh, you know, the extent to which uh, we've had to rest on the foundations built many years ago across every generation of public service officer to deal with our COVID-19 pandemic uh, actually is the, in a way a testament to the fact that we can't stop doing that fundamental work even while we have COVID-19 ongoing. Um, a lot of our response, a lot of our capability to hold both uh, body and soul and our society together while the worst of the pandemic was with us, but also in terms of preparing for the next bound as we need to emerge stronger, rests on a, a platform of uh, technological literacy, digital familiarity, and, and the public service is at the heart of this and has a very important role to play. Uh, we got here because we embraced being that sort of public service many years ago. And so now today we have to plan for the next bound and this Digital Academy is very much part of it. So once again, thank you very much to all the public sector officers for your commitment to our public good. And I hope you take this opportunity uh, at the Digital Academy for your own personal professional development. Thank you. Thank you, SMS Janel. Uh, with that, uh, distinguished guests and friends, we will call time on this very insightful panel discussion. And on behalf of uh, uh, close to 400 people in the audience, uh, officers, leaders, and guests, I'd like to place my sincere appreciation to SNS Janil, Patrick, and Vive for your perspectives, nudges, and most importantly, call to action. Before I hand over to our host and then Ping Soon, Chief Executive of GovTech, for his closing, I wish to share a quote and leave you all with a question. The spirit of investing in our own development was reiterated by all our speakers today. I'm reminded of a quote by Albert Einstein, who said, I have no special talent. I'm only passionately curious. In that spirit, let me leave you with a question to mull over. How ready to learn will you be if you plan to be extraordinary? With that, Joe, over to you. Thank you very much. And what a great panel where some great expectations were set. And I think the message we all take away from that is about the intellectual curiosity that is being encouraged. And along with that, some intellectual humility that will allow any embarrassment that comes along with that to be a part of that journey. We want to say a big thank you to our esteemed panelists, Dr. Janel Puducherry, Dr. Patrick Teo, Ms. Ng Wei Wei, and of course our moderator, Mr. D.N. Prasad. Now, this is just the beginning. 
What we have in store for you is a complimentary week-long virtual learning festival curated just for you. Featuring 50 sessions across five main focus tracks, the festival will cover pertinent topics such as cybersecurity on day one, app infrastructure and ICT infrastructure on day two, app management and apps development on day three, technology and product management and data science and AI on day four, and new technology such as sensors, internet of things, modeling and simulation and digital leadership on day five. You'll get to hear from domain experts and industry leaders from organizations including Google, Microsoft, Secure Code Warrior, GovTech, and NUSISS who will be sharing rich insights from their fields of expertise. You can also look forward to an exciting lineup of activities comprising webinars, panels, discussions, workshops, like the Secure Coding Tournament that's coming up today at 2.30 p.m. Now what's more, you'll get a taster of the comprehensive suite of courses that will be delivered at the Digital Academy. You can also check out the upcoming courses available at the digitalacademy.tech.gov.sg. And with that, we have come to the end of the Digital Academy's virtual launch symposium. But as I said earlier, this is just the start of the Learning Festival. Uh, we're going to encourage you to tune in again this afternoon. Um, at 2 o'clock is when we'll start the webinar. The webinar will be open again at 2 p.m., but the session will start at 2.30 p.m. today to experience the coding tournament uh, with Secure Code Warrior. Now, if you haven't already, we invite you to register for the sessions now. At this particular point, what we're going to invite you to do is to log off and then join us back again in the, in the webinar room at 2 p.m. To our distinguished guests and everyone who's logged in, thank you once again for being with us this morning. And I sincerely hope you enjoy the rest of your day. My name is Joe Augustin. It has been my honor to be your host this morning. The Virtual Launch Symposium and Learning Festival is brought to you by the Digital Academy. Be at the intersection of public service and technology. <laughs>